Hello, everybody. Great to be with you today. I'd like to begin by presenting you the brain of a loyal customer. There it is. That's the brain of a loyal customer. You want your customers' brains to look exactly like this. This is your target. This is your goal. This comes from an experiment that's really interesting. What they did is they had two groups of people. They had one group of people that were loyal customers of a particular department store. And they would go to this department store very frequently. They'd spend a lot of money. And they had a second group of folks that were on that same database for that department store, but they only rarely shopped at that particular store and they didn't spend much money. So what they did is they asked these people to go through an MRI, and what they did is they uh, asked them to do something really simple. They asked them to go shop for an article of clothing. While they were doing that, they would put up the logos of various department stores. And for the loyal customers, when they saw this particular logo, this part of the brain lit up like a Christmas tree. But for those disloyal customers, that same part of the brain was quiet, did not activate. Now, this part of the brain is really interesting. This is, a, this is a part called the ventral striatum. And it's part of your midbrain, and it's part of your reward system. And what it does, it actually uh, sits in a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. And what it does is it encodes expected future rewards. So what the experiment showed is that people who were loyal would associate that particular brand with higher expected future rewards. Makes sense, right? Well, it sits in this larger structure called the basal ganglia, which is responsible for action selection. So for every goal-based decision that we make as people, the basal ganglia picks the answer. If we have A, B, and C as options, it says we're doing B. That's what we're doing. So the basal ganglia makes the final choice. It is the final judge and it starts action after that decision is made. Now, what's interesting about this part of the brain also is that when you get very high activation, it affects another part of the brain called the medial prefrontal cortex, which is right here in the middle of your forehead and back about an inch. And that acts as a switch between your two parts of your brain. We all have two parts. We have system one and system two. System one is our emotional processing system. It is subconscious. It is intuitive. And our system two is our logical, rational, conscious system. So when this is high, what it does is it shuts off your logical system. And what happens is your subconscious tells your conscious brain, we're doing this, right? We have made this decision, and there's no debate about this. So if this is high enough, it's actually a no-brainer when customers make that loyalty decision. Now, how many of you have had that happen? How many, how many of you have observed that in real life? You call up a customer at renewal time, and you say, hey, I need to do your renewal. And they say, wow, is it that time again? Here's my check, right? It's a no-brainer. How many of you have that? You've called those customers, and they just do it automatically, right? So loyalty researchers call that affective commitment. It is a no-brainer. And uh, what happens in affective commitment is people do business with you because they want to do business with you. Now, on the other side of the coin, you probably have customers that you call that they say, uh, you say, hey, it's time for renewal, and they say, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute here. Slow down, we'll get back to you. Then they go offline and out come the spreadsheets. Then they do the comparison matrices, right? They compare you against all the other competitive technologies. They look at price. They look at the cost and risk of switching from you to someone else. And they're probably going to grind you on the price, too, right? How many of you have that happen, right? OK. So that's called calculative commitment. Come on. Calculative commitment. So this is what happens when you don't have that activation in that part of the brain. The medial prefrontal cortex switch, switches the other way, and this is a logical thing. So what happens is we, uh, customers will burn a lot of cycles trying to figure all this stuff out. These folks are at risk, aren't they? These are the ones you really worry about because they could go one way or the other. This is calculative commitment. Now, um, What's the secret of this? How do we get that striatum to activate in the way that we want? 
Well, the secret is this, dopamine. This is a drug that the brain uses to train us on uh, behaviors that are good for us, and it works like this. If we have a behavior that's good for us, what the brain does is it rewards us for that behavior. It releases the substance dopamine, and it feels really good. We feel great when we get that little shot of dopamine. How many of you have had an orgasm before? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, nobody raised their hand. That's weird, that's just weird. Um, dopamine is a, you know, when we have an orgasm, that's, that's a huge blast of dopamine. It feels terrific, it feels outstanding. Now, on the other side of that, if we have a behavior that's bad for us, the dopamine gets shut off and we get a punishment from that. So how many of you have had a time in your life when you suffered a major disappointment? Maybe there was someone that you really liked and you asked them on a date and they totally rejected you. How many of you have had that happen? Yeah, we've all had, we all went to high school, right? We all had that situation. Okay, this feels like a shot to the gut. This feels terrible. So the brain uses this dopamine to reward or punish us depending upon behaviors that are good for us or bad for us, right? So the brain uses this in reinforcement learning. So how this works is whenever we learn something new, the brain sets an expectation for an outcome. It has an expectation. We perform the behavior, and if, we're, if the results of that behavior are above our expectations, we get this shot of dopamine. We feel really good. But if it's below those expectations, then we get punished for it, right? Now, in reinforcement learning, what happens is the brain will move that anchor over time. So if we start here, uh, we perform this behavior, we get our little shot of dopamine, the brain will raise that anchor. Next time through, we, we do the same behavior, we get that same reward, the brain raises that anchor again. So what happens is over time, you get something that looks like this. So you start over here, and as you have a series of experiences, that anchor is going to rise or it's going to fall over time. Now, at the end of the day, what causes this activation is dopamine, but it's a little different type of dopamine. Rather than this phasic or this bursty dopamine, it's what's called tonic dopamine. It's, it's uh, background levels or, or noise floors of dopamine. Now, what the brain does over time, and they're not exactly sure how it does it, but the brain will actually convert one to the other, from this bursty to this background tonic dopamine. And that's what, calls, uh, that's what causes this excitement in the brain, which leads to either your affective commitment or your calculative commitment, okay? Now, what's interesting about this is that experiences, we all talk about customer experience. It's not about what the experience is, it's really about how we remember that experience. The brain throws out a lot of data. I mean, we only recall a, a few things here and there from our experiences. People typically will remember what happened first, what happened last, and maybe a couple of peaks in between, and that's about it, right? They forget about the rest. We are all just processors. We all kind of get the basic meaning, and we throw out the details. So at the end of the day, the brain encodes this and makes an association for us. That was good for us, we want to repeat that, or that was bad for us, we don't want to repeat that, okay? Now, scientists found something really interesting that happens over here on the end where it all starts. Remember when I talked about reinforcement learning, it starts with an expectation. So what happens in a novel situation when the brain doesn't know what to expect? What happens? How does the brain do that? Any ideas? How does that happen? What do we do? Any guesses? Correlate with previous stimulation? Yeah, we look at something similar or, or what else? We kind of we make it up. We kind of guess at what that is. Now, scientists have found that people are very suggestible at this time, right? They can prime people, which will change their behavior. They can make a suggestion either directly or very subtly that will alter people's behavior. They will accept what you tell them, what that expectation is, and they're gonna run with that. And what happens is uh, they continue to behave in that particular pattern. That's something called confirmation bias. Has anybody heard of confirmation bias before? What is that? What is confirmation bias? 
Exactly. We, we notice information that supports our beliefs, and we ignore information that contradicts our beliefs. So we stay on that path. So it's really easy over here to put someone on a path by suggesting what, what is the true belief here. Now, that's, that's all very interesting. What does this tell you about your customer success strategy? If this is how the brain works, what should you be doing? Pardon me? Or mind them they're doing a good job? What else? When people are, are doing their renewals, where do they engage? Over here, isn't it? This is reacting, right? You're reacting to what's going on. Over here, those beliefs are pretty well established over time. How hard is it to change someone's beliefs? That's really hard, right? So if you engage customers way over here, and you want to change what they think based upon their experience, good luck with that, right? I mean, most saves, if you look at saves, you call up your cable provider and say, I want to switch to another provider. They try to save you. That's about 10 to 15% effective. So 85 to 90%, you're going to lose. And when you get that business, guess what? You got to buy it. You got to give it away, right? So if you engage over here, it's way too late. Now, around this conference, people talk about being proactive, right? Go get your customer health scores, figure out where it is somewhere in here in advance of that, reach out to those customers, and then try to build those relationships, right? That's being proactive. I submit to you that is also too late. Where do you want to be? Right over there. That's where you have the most impact. That's being preventative. You are preventing churn from happening in the first place, right? That's a really good use of your time because that's how the brain works. If you can catch them there and you can send them on the right path, you don't have to worry about what happens over here, right? That makes sense. Just work with how the brain works. That's what we're talking about. So initial impressions really, really matter. So you can see where we're going with this. Your customer experience is, is a form of, <clears throat> form of reinforcement learning, right? Every time your customer interacts with you, they learn something about you. They learn whether or not your technology does what it, you say it does, whether it's reliable. When they have a problem, they call up, they see if they get good, good fast support, if it's a good quality, right? So every time that our customer connects with us, they're learning. That's a learning process. Why is it that so many companies leave this to chance? Why is it so many companies go out there and say, let's just set this up and hope for the best, right? Hope is not a very good strategy. Very high performing companies do something different. They understand cause and effect relationships. They kind of get how this works and they don't leave things to chance. Success is not luck. So what they do is they start with understanding what is the customer experience from the customer's perspective, not from our perspective, but what are they doing? And how do they phrase that? How do they talk about that? So they start there and they define what that customer experience is. Then they look at effective and affective needs. Effective needs are logical, rational, practical things. They need to get information, they need to make decisions, they need to use your product, they need to learn how to use your product, great. But they also look at what's affective. How do we want them to feel while they're doing that? And what can we do to make them feel a certain way? Then what they do is they go into their process and they look at how do, we, how do these handoffs work and who's doing what and what's our UX doing, right? So it's very, very deliberate, systematic, well-designed, well-executed and continuously improving. And that's what drives customer loyalty. That's what drives high renewal rates. This is the kind of work I do with my clients, and what we do is we apply this neuroscience to it, because there's some really cool stuff that you can do that drives that type of behavior. Now, as I mentioned before, customers may work with you hundreds of times in your subscription period. And most of the time, they're not gonna remember all that stuff, but there are five critical moments that if you execute well, customers are never gonna leave you, right? There's five of these. They don't give me a whole lot of time to go through all these. So I'm gonna talk about one in particular. It's called a moment of connection. And in this moment of connection, 
Uh, let me give you a very practical, very uh, easy thing that you can go and do that is going to give you immediate results. It's my gift to you today. And it's all about this. It's about faces. This is really cool. This is the very first skill that all of us have. We're born with this skill, is recognizing faces. Okay? We are so good at this that we see faces everywhere. We see faces in the clouds. We see faces in rock formations. We see faces when we look at a car, the front part of a car, right? So in potato chips, you name it, we see faces everywhere. It's, it's a great skill that we have. And researchers have found that uh, we actually make a determination about people's trustworthiness on their face. When we look at someone's face, in our brains, in less than 100 milliseconds, which is three times faster than you can blink your eye, you've made a determination about whether you trust somebody. It sets that anchor that we talked about before, that initial anchor of trust, based upon their face. What do we look at? Eyes and the mouth. What can you tell from the eyes and the mouth? Their emotion. So if I'm, if I'm happy, right? Or if I'm really angry, right? So you can tell that, right? Why do I need to know that? Why do humans need to know that that fast? Why is that useful? Yeah, you're gonna get killed, right? It's, it's, this, is, this is natural selection here. If you're able to detect someone's emotional state by looking at them, then you're probably going to survive. You're going to be able to pass on those genetics, right? That's what that's all about. So this is a skill that we evolved, is being able to tell uh, humans' emotional states by looking at their face. Now, interesting thing that researchers have found out is that you can use faces to prime behaviors. When they do uh, games, cooperative games with people, investment games, trust-based games, and they show them a smiling face, it alters their behavior. They become 15 to 20% more cooperative because they showed them a face. That's really weird, isn't it? They show a face on there, and subconsciously people cooperate more. Now that's really cool. What can you do with that tidbit of information? What can all of you do with that? Show you, yeah, FaceTime, show your face, show pictures. This is a no-brainer, right? Oops, sorry. Everywhere. Put faces everywhere. Put them on your website. Use web conferencing, right? You know, use Zoom or whatever you want. Put your face out there. It's not important that you see your customer. It's important that they see you because they will start to build attachment. They will start to trust you just because they see your face. This is something, there's a company in uh, Colorado Springs called BombBomb. Bomb. They have a really cool little product that does, you can send like little videos to your customers. You can talk on the screen and send a video and track everything that happened, really neat. And then up here, your signature line. This is a slam dunk. All of you should be doing this. In your signature line, put your picture. I'm not talking about the, the teeny tiny little, you know, picture that you get from Google, right? Have something that's big that you can see your expression, that you can see your face. And not one of those with you, you know, on a skateboard with dark glasses on doing whatever in the background. That's not going to help you very much, right? So a nice professional picture looking right into the, the, the camera and smiling. This will alter behavior. Really cool. Fifth, uh, between uh, 15 and 20 percent more cooperative. Now, I can't tell you how much more money you're gonna make because of this. I can't, right? I can't predict that. But I'll tell you what, having customers that are more cooperative, there's some value to that. And if it takes you two minutes to throw that into your signature line, everybody should do that. It's a slam dunk, right? Little trick, this is a little moment of connection. So, let's wrap up. Here are your key takeaways. A history of rewarding experiences boosts customer loyalty, and we've proven that. First impressions really, really matter. If you want to make an impact on a customer, 
when those beliefs are still kind of fungible, still kind of coming together, that's the time to focus on that. High renewal rates require more than luck. Be very systematic, be very deliberate and thoughtful about how you do that. Design really good processes. If you have good processes, you get good results. If you have lousy processes, you get lousy results. That's just the way it is, it's physics. And adding a friendly photo is one very easy way to create a moment of connection. Those are your takeaways. There's me, there's my picture. <laughs> Here's my website. If this stuff interests you, I'm fascinated by the brain. I think it's totally cool. And I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg is applying neuroeconomics and what we do. That's what I do with my clients. If you'd like to read more about that, I have a huge blog, many, many pages. You're welcome to come visit. If you wanna hear about my services, it's on there as well. So, that's it. Any questions? We've got about 10 minutes left. Thank you. Thank you very much. They're all taking pictures. I don't know if they, who has questions. Yeah, I got questions? my picture. You don't have to take my no, picture. No, they're taking <laughs> Questions? Questions. Can we pass this down for Yes, ma'am. Oops. I'm sorry. They're, they're, Hey, Ed, thank you very much for that. That was great. And clearly sure. you planted the seeds in our mind. I'm sure that was intentional on saying there are five critical moments that matter and you told yes. us one. So it's how a do we, yes. So how do we uh, hear about the other four? Sure. Uh, real quickly, I can, I can tell you it's moments of connection, moments of power, moments of proof, moments of truth, and moments of wow. So it's connection, power, proof, truth, and wow. Those are the big ones. And I have this all on my website. I have multiple articles on each one of them. We had a question up front, right? Yep, here we go. Same question. Okay. Oh, same okay. question. All right. Anybody else? Yep. Oh, here you go, just so that they can catch it. Oh, all right. So you were saying that, you know, the first impression, you were showing that nice chart with going down and going up. Yep. So, but there are still customers who start off with a great first impression mm -hmm. and they still leave you at some point, right? Because of some bad experience. So do you know, I mean, do you have a sense of what it is that is hugely counterproductive to a customer who has had a very favorable first impression that would require, that would result in them leaving? I mean, what kind of thing, just be something really big, I would imagine, right? Yeah, there's, there's actually, um, there's, there's four main reasons why people will leave you, only four. The first one is unmet expectations for quality and value. That's number one, that's probably, you know, uh, 70 to 80% of it has to do with your, the quality of your products and services. Have you oversold it? Is it performing the way you want? That's most of it right there. The second major reason why people will switch is that it's easy to switch, right? There's, if you're not, if you're not a monopoly and you have a lot of options, that alone is gonna increase your, your churn rate. The last one is this lack of attachment, right? lack of attachment, that I'm indifferent or I'm, you know, um, I really don't care. Um, I have mixed feelings maybe about a vendor, but I don't have a very strong attachment, right? So the attachment piece can be anywhere between 15 and 20% of the equation. So what we talked about is really about attachment and what can we do to increase that? It does not solve a product problem. It doesn't solve a market problem. And then the last factor is, you know, if a customer doesn't buy from anybody, they go out of business, right? Or they close a division or something, you can't do anything about that. And that's gonna be, you know, four to five percent of the time, they just go poof, right? They're gone. So you can't do anything about that. This is really about what you can influence, which is that level of attachment. And you can do that very deliberately. Um, so you brought up some really great ways to like set expectations going in with a customer and the importance of sort of those initial impressions. Do you have strategies based on some of the research that you've read or the you know, engagements that you've had about mo the most effective ways to um, fix first impressions gone wrong, so to speak, or yeah. um, expectations where the expectations haven't been met? And can you talk a little bit about that? I just wrote a blog about this, as a matter of fact. Oh, yes, well you, can, you can look at my latest blog on this. But uh, actually expectations, you know, a lot of times we'll point the finger at salespeople that, you know, we'll look what they did to us. They oversold this thing. And sometimes that's warranted, that's fully justified because we all know how quota works and people are under pressure and a little greedy, you know, they're gonna maybe, you know, do some things that probably aren't good. But the other side of that is people themselves 
will hear something or process something and they will misset their own expectations, right? So a lot of times what we do is we kind of point the finger, it's not really fair. I mean, uh, there are times when customers just kind of come up with really wild stuff and you don't know how they got there. So part of the role I think for a customer success manager, and I do have in the blog some ideas that you can do throughout the sales process to keep people grounded, to keep them from going off the rails, and is showing a little bit of data here and there. I mean, simple things like that. When you challenge your system two, your logical brain, to put your emotional brain in check, guess what? You bring them down to earth a little bit. And you can do it very subtly, but if you're very deliberate about that, you will prevent them from forming really off the wall expectations and keep your salespeople in check too, right? So a lot of this is you, you can't wait until, okay, we signed that order and now we're gonna really tell you what the deal is. You wanna, you wanna pepper that into the whole process and don't always jump to the conclusion that your, that your salespeople are doing this. That's not always true. <laughs> exactly, that's Daniel, you bet, you bet. Anybody else? What other questions do you have? Oh, up oh, front. Oh, my so, track shoes on today. One thing I, sorry, one thing I, I didn't <coughs> see in your presentation, and I don't know if that's valid or not, is the power of referrals and mm -hmm. other people, yep. fellow customers, yep. and what they have to say about your product. Uh, so kind of like the, the, you know, the confirmation bias that you were talking about. Yes. So is that something that's uh, important? Yeah, social proof and uh, reducing risk. Back to Daniel Kahneman, uh, the uh, prospect theory is that we are, humans are normally uh, in a positive frame, are looking at upside for things. We are risk averse. So we're looking at ways, whether we're conscious of it or not, we wanna take the risk out of the equation. So social proof is a, is a very helpful way to reduce risk, right? They're like me, I'll make an attribution error because they're like me, their problems are the same as my problems, so therefore, if it's solved for them, it will solve for me. They're jumping to a conclusion there, but you know, it, it builds a sense of trust. So yes, it is very important to have uh, proof points. This is the, some of these moments of proof I talk about, these five critical moments. A moment of proof can very well be social proof, and it takes risk out of the equation for them. And for one more question. Taker. All right, thank you, Ed. Oh, you bet. did I miss one? No, no, where is it? I missed you. I'm sorry. But I was, I was actually going to make a comment and just, you know, affirm some of the things you said. Uh, we always talk within our team about people make decisions emotionally and then they justify logically. Exactly. Even when it's a logical person, they had a commitment to something emotionally that ties to their logic. Uh, but one of the things that we really do and we focus on is uh, champion building. Because we need to, you know, we're a little bit of a different organization. We do sell mostly B2B. So the success of our product is going to generally be tied to somebody fighting for us when we're not there. Yeah. So we are really uh, focused on, and this was great insight and understanding kind of the logic behind how, well, I should say how people emotionally make that decision and justify it. But it's the only way, I think, for us to successfully keep our customers is to have that person there fighting for us when we're not there. So... Uh, I think this will be great for me to kind of align some of this with our champion building work that we do. Yep. And so you raise you. a really good point is that we think that we make these logical, rational decisions at the end of the day, and they've proven this, without our, our emotional processing, without our system one, we are incapable of making decisions. We have to have emotional processes. Otherwise, we sit there and we spin all day long. When people have brain damage in parts of the brain that do the emotional processing, people are physically incapable of making a decision. So all decisions, the evidence is really showing, all decisions are made in the subconscious emotionally, and to your point, logic is there to justify it. Thanks very much, great having you. Hope, hope you have a wonderful conference, and hope to see you again.